So hello everyone and welcome to the Forum for Youth Insights. I'm Anna Hunt. I work at Concordia University's uh, Quesgrin, Quebec English Speaking Community Research Network. I will be your first MC for today and we also have... Hi, my... I am Samantha Nyanaomonu and I, I work at the uh, Black Community Resource Centre. Thanks. Um, so um, today's event is organised by Quesgrin, the Black Community Resource Centre and the Youth Youth Quebec. Thank you to everyone who's here for coming. Uh, and before continuing, I'd like to acknowledge that all uh, the Indigenous people of all the lands that we're on today, while we meet on a virtual platform, Concordia University is located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Kanyakahage Nation is recognised as the custodians of these lands and waters on which we gather today. Georgiage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today is the home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Um, this event is made possible through the financial support of the Secretariat for Relations with English-speaking Quebecers, the Department of Canadian Heritage, Concordia University, and the Consortium of English Language Cégeps, Colleges, and Universities of Quebec. We have our first speaker, who is Natasha Blanchet-Cohen, and I'm going to hand the, the virtual mic over to Sam to introduce our first keynote speaker. Thank you, Anna. I'm Dr. Natasha Cohen Blanchett is an associate professor in the Department of Applied Human Science at Concordia University um, and a graduate director of the Youth Work Diploma. She is also the co-director of the Quebec Youth Research Network Chair. Her research focuses on community youth development, child rights and participation, eco-citizenship and developmental evaluation. And now over to you, Natasha. Hi, everybody. Um, so you can hear me well? Yes. Great. Okay, so uh, good afternoon on this uh, beautiful Sunday afternoon, uh, crisp, but gorgeous. So thank you, everybody, for taking the time to spend your afternoon together. Online, again, for some of you. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I, I know many of you are not in Montreal, but I'm located on the Kanyakaha territory. And these are the custodians of the land and the water. And uh, historically, this place has been a, one of gathering. And I think it's important to remember our connections to the past, to the present, and the future, and our relationships with Indigenous people and other people. Uh, for me, this is important to set the tone of my presentation today at the beginning of this important event, of which I love the title, Forum for Youth Insights, Career and Education Orientation for the Post-COVID-19 World. Yes, we do think, need to think about the after COVID and how to prepare for a world that will be different and how you as young people, and it's great to see I'm looking at all the young people. I can't see all your faces. It's more the older people who put on their cameras, it seems, uh, that you are shaping um, this world and how are you gonna do it in meaningful ways. Uh, more specifically, I wanna talk a little bit about how young people um, are going to be building resilient community in 2020 and beyond. I've been working in this era for a long time. It dates back probably to my CEGEP years uh, when I was in the campaign against Jeunes étudiants contre l'apartheid. Um, it was an important part of my uh, training, I would say. Um, I was fortunate because I joined shortly after the downfall of apartheid. But this engagement gave me a sense of meaning in making me feel that I was part of a collective change, which has stayed with me to this day. And 30 years later, you can calculate my age, uh, I continue to see the importance of supporting youth energy and creativity. Um, there may be a certain naivety of young people, and that certainly was my case at the time, but I think it allows young people to be bold forthcoming in unique ways, enabling you to respond with fresh ideas to the current realities that we face today. Because I think too often young people's voices and viewpoints are not given enough importance to. You're seen as the future generation and you kind of like need to wait your turn. In the context of COVID-19, you are called upon to sacrifice your social time to protect the seniors and you've taken on this responsibility seriously as a member, feeling you're a member of a community. But the media hasn't always been gracious towards you, 
headlines state that the millennials have been spreading the virus and putting seniors at risk. All this talk on safety may make you feel that your right to participation takes second place, yet your right to participation is equal to safety and protection and you are, are citizens that have equal rights. Your rights haven't always been heard, but you have the right to be supported in being able to participate. And through my research and my teaching in the youth work program at, uh, at Concordia University, I've been dedicated to pointing its importance that as older generations and institutions, we have a responsibility to give you the appropriate space and supports for you to express and act upon your ideas, which often requires a shift in our training as adults. But to frame my thoughts today, um, I'd like to share this image. Um, I think, Anna, you're going to show the image. Yes. Can I see it? I can't see it. But can everybody else see? Oh, great. Okay. So maybe some of you have seen this image before, but it's been in the papers a lot, um, in the Globe and Mail, um, including. Uh, and I really like it. Um, it I, when I saw it the first time, it really stood out for me. And when I was invited for this presentation, I said, this is the image I'm going to use. Because I feel it really represents how we're feeling today and what's going on and where we want to go. It shows that we're entering in a world where there's lots of twists and turns and disruptions to our daily lives and to our routines. And we kind of feel like we're sometimes going in circles. You know, there's locked ions opening up. You really aren't too sure of what the next months will look like. How long are we going to be going, doing our classes online? What is the job market going to look like? Is my degree going to lead to a job? Are we going to celebrate Halloween or Christmas? And these are causes of great anxiety and fear. And I can see it in the courses that I teach with the students. They're worried and it's a time of uncertainty and it's understandable. But the figure also shows that there's an arrow out of the maze, a direction that we are moving towards. And I think that's what I'm intrigued about and what I want to talk about today is how are we going to come out the other end and how are we going to come out together and stronger and you can maybe remove the image if I think people have it in their head Anna um, so um, and I have a few points to make today um, that come from what we already know but that overall make me feel positive about how we're going to come out of that maze. First of all, it's around resiliency. Second, it's about being part of changing the narrative of fear. And three, it's about being strength-based. The first cause for hope is around the idea of resiliency. We as human beings have the ability to bounce back. We know that after big trauma, wars, natural disasters, that we are wired to recover. And think about a forest after a fire. There's new seedlings that appear after this great destruction. And that actually a forest may be healthier with stronger trees as the soil is more fertile. So forest fires, natural forest fires, I'm saying, not due to climate change, <laughs> are important and it's an opportunity for renewal. So that is reassuring. After this pandemic, we will bounce back. Imagine a ball, you throw a ball, it will bounce back. There may be some ups and downs, some zigzags along the way, because research does also show that it's not a linear process and the propensity to bounce back will depend on the individuals and society. While there is something about resilience being inherent to human beings, there are some things that can help in strengthening it. And I think that's what's also really important. That is our capacity as individual, individuals to navigate our way to resources that can help us in our well being and the individual and collective capacity to negotiate the resources that have access to those resources. To borrow from a well known researcher on the topic, Michael Ungar. So, one question to ask yourself is how to enhance my individual and community capacity to navigate in today's world? 
are there things happening in our society during the COVID-19 time that could contribute to increasing my, your, ours, capacity to navigate and negotiate? And this leads me to my second point around the fact that I think our narrative, the way that our story is being told, who are the actors, the heroes, the secondary actors is changing and youth are at the center of that. We are in a process of transformation. Since COVID-19, social injustices are being denounced in North America in ways that have not happened for a long time. Indigenous and Black Lives Matter make the headlines. Leaders of today have to respond. They cannot ignore these voices. They are being asked to acknowledge that systemic racism exists and that actions must be taken in response. It's not only about social justice, it's also about in the environmental crisis and young people have been at the forefront of these movements as black, indigenous and allies. Just as one example, many of you were probably at the um, climate change march in September before COVID, um, half a million people gathered in response to 16 year old Greta Thunberg's um, call for coming to marching out in the streets. This is a youth-led movement where adults joined and followed youth. There are these outright actions and many are visual, but also others that are equally important that may not be as apparent, that are part of changing this narrative. In so many ways, you are more inclusive. You have been in multicultural classrooms. You consider respect and accommodation for different traditions a given. You demand and use a language that is sensitive to different sexual orientations. I see that. I see that with my children, my teenage children. I see that in the youth sessions that I facilitate. Your education has emphasized critical thinking and you have grown up in classrooms where there are global connections that you are making that put you in a unique situation brings you an understanding. Your reflexes differ from those of the older generation. As millennials, you have, your increased capacity also comes from being part of seeing how changes in lifestyle, in our consumption and travel habits can bring about the profound changes we need for being a sustainable society in the future. The forced lockdown caused by COVID-19 brought about reductions in CO2 emissions, making us realize what is possible. This makes you, I would argue, a key driver of building a stronger community, more resilient, that you can become a proponent of this new way of life because you've been part of authoring it. You are, more, you are less fearful than the older generation maybe because your, your stakes are less high, but that puts you in a unique place. The third point is around the importance of being positive. We know that solutions are more likely to come when we work from strengths. Surprisingly and unfortunately, a lot of our society is based on a deficit-based approach. We basically focus on what's not working What's a problem? We hear a lot, a lot with young people as being disengaged, apolitical, apathetic. What I've learned from elders and research is that working from strengths and the gifts that every one of us brings is likely to lead to solutions that work. One example with youth is around the use of social media that you use a lot. While there is a lot of criticism around social media at this time, uh, when you're reading in the papers and stuff about people spending too much time, young people spending too much time on the online and it's, and it's a detriment to their health. And this very, very well may be the case. It is also true that youth are extraordinarily adept at using social media. Social media is actually a great asset and particularly at this time in creating and giving you a sense of community to socialize and communicate with your buddies, to put your ideas out there in different groups to hear from others. In my community development class, I always used to engage in a big discussion on whether the online was a, a community, whether it met the definition of a community. I used to be skeptical 
But now I realize they have a point. Yes. So social media can be seen as a strength where youth are in the driver's seat. In this case, the older generations need to learn from youth. It's an opportunity for intergenerational partnership. There is a lot to be discovered in increasing these connections across generations in ways that draw on each other's strengths. Because for sure, one of the legacies of COVID-19 will be our realization that we need each other. We cannot take these social connections for granted in the same way as before. This is all good news as coming back to the forest metaphor, a healthy forest needs diversity, multiple species, young and old. Monocultures make forests fragile, susceptible to diseases. So in conclusion, as you think about your education and career aspirations this afternoon, the weeks to come, maybe the years to come, it can be daunting. But a focus on your resiliency, on knowing you are part of changing the narrative, that you as a generation have a vision of a certain future that is more inclusive, sustainable, and relevant can help, I am convinced, to propel you, us, to move forward, to, determ to determine how we will come out of that maze and the arrow ahead. Nurture your confidence, turn to the positive. Uncertainty can be paralyzing, or it's a time to breathe deeply, to refocus on the opportunities this changed world offers. Continue to be creative and to think outside the box. And on the note of the importance of participation, we wanted to give you, we hope that you've been uh, taking the time to fill out the poll that we sent out um, to hear about how you feel and maybe how you respond to some of the points in relationships to some of the points that I made. And so here are the results. I mean, everybody, oh, okay, are you filling just, it out now? Yeah, we just launched a poll right now. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. So yeah, we have a few minutes. Everyone can start filling it out. Excellent. So I think just to set the tone and to hear about who you are, where you situate yourself in relation to some of these points, we have a six uh, question, six phrases for you to fill out. So maybe you can take a few minutes to fill it out quickly and then we can look at the results together. Yes, all youth to do. I think we only wanna hear uh, from youth. So youth, let's say uh, between 15 and 30. Some participants might fill, fit the youth criteria as well. Presenters, I'm not sure. So we'll give you a couple of minutes to fill that out and then we can just see the results. I'll share the results in about 15 seconds. Okay, great. Your first response, you don't need to think too much. <laughs> it's anonymous too. Yeah, it's anonymous. Give another, another 10 seconds because people still are still answering. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, the numbers are going up. Excellent. Okay, here we go. Okay. I will share it now. Okay, great. So yeah, this idea was just to hear a little bit about where do you situate yourself regarding some statements. So we'll do a quick analysis. So the first question was, I feel hopeful about the future. And the strongest response is around four. 
Um, so I guess the majority are between a three and four. So this is a fairly hopeful group, I would say. And let's go to the next one, um, which is a really important one, I think, for the topic of the day. I can't see down. I don't know if you can. Oh, there I see. Yes. Since COVID, I am more worried about my education career. And a lot of you are saying that yes, a lot that and, and that you so you're situated a, a same number around the four, um, which I think is something really important for the following speakers to think about and to respond to. And the uh, number three, I am engaged in my community. Interesting that it's almost equal par, a three and a four, uh, meaning that uh, you are fairly um, engaged in your community. I'd be really, I, if we had more time, I'd love to hear from you what, do, what does that mean and how are you engaged in your community and what is that looking like in the context of COVID as well and how you define your communities but I will leave it to the other speakers. And the fourth question is, I feel that I can shape my future. And 45% of you feel that you can shape your future. So I think my presentation was on the ball. That means that you do feel empowered. You may be concerned about where you're going and you're worried about your education and career, but you do feel you can shape your future. So that is a really interesting point to keep in mind. I feel anxious about the environmental crisis. 41%, so actually, if you add that up, that is, um, you know, 65, uh, yeah, 65% agree or totally agree. So it's definitely top on the list. And I am concerned about social justice issues. 45% indicate total, totally agree, um, which is really uh, interesting as well. So thank you so much for your responses. I think this gives us some really good points to pick up later on and that um, this will be a useful presentation an afternoon session for you to hear from the other speakers. So thank you so much um, for this opportunity and I uh, hope to connect with you in the near future. Thank you so much, Natasha. That was a very engaging um, speech. Um, and now we'll um, hear from our second keynote, Madeline Lawler. Uh, Madeline is a president of Youth for Youth Quebec, as well as a civil law student at l'Université de Montréal. She holds a Bachelor of Public Affairs and a Policy and Policy Management from Carleton University, and has worked for various parts of the federal of the federal civil service, including the Library of Parliament and Parks of Canada. Now over to you, Madeline. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Blanchet Cohen, for your practical pieces of advice and encouraging us as youth to participate and emphasizing that our voices matter. And thank you to all of you who decided to spend your Sunday afternoons discussing the issues facing the futures of your industries and your careers when you could be watching Netflix or enjoying one of the last few beautiful weekend afternoons outdoors. If you're here, because you not only have dreams and aspirations, but because you also understand the hard work and dedication needed to make meaningful and substantial change. So thank you. And before we get started with the workshops, I'm going to, to the best of my abilities, set the mood by speaking a little bit about youth, work, and the future. I'd like to start with a trip down memory lane, a little bit of nostalgia. In October 2019, a year ago, I was in my final year of my Bachelor of Public Affairs and Policy Management at Carleton University in Ottawa. With only a semester and a half left until graduation, I had started putting thought into what to do after my degree. I wasn't too sure about what to do next, as a lot of soon-to-be grads are, so I put my eggs in multiple baskets. I applied for post-secondary recruitment jobs for the Federal Civil Service. I applied to a master's program here at Concordia, and I had always wanted to pursue law, so I started looking into law schools in Sherbrooke, Montreal, and Quebec City. I contemplated taking a year off before returning to my studies to give myself a break and a change of pace. Clearly, 
I had no idea what I was going to do and where I was going to be in a year, but it felt freeing and full of opportunity. In attempts to reassure me, my mom often said that the world was my oyster, that I had no obligations to be any specific place doing any particular thing in a year's time. I think you know how the story ends and is probably very familiar to all of you. When March rolled around, I still had no set plans for my post-graduation life, but I had a lot of exciting opportunities lined up to explore. A lot of those got canceled or postponed or put on hold within the span of 48 hours. As a part of the class of 2020, I am a member of the first cohort to graduate from Zoom University. My brother, who was finishing his second year at John Abbott College in the professional theater program, watched the future career he had planned in the events and live production industry be thrown into a state of unpredictability. A friend of mine who, like me, graduated in the spring of 2020, had planned to take a gap year to work and boost her grad school application, but instead watched the series of internships she had worked so hard to land get canceled. I could go on, but I won't, because we all know this tale. We all lived it and are still living it. I really didn't want to make this speech about COVID-19 because frankly, I know that I attend events like these to distract myself from my COVID-19 reality. As I said before, my academic background is in public policy and I was taught to rely heavily on research for drafting papers, policy briefs, and presentations. So when I sat down to write this speech and started to do some research, like any good policy student, I tried in vain to find a way to talk as little bit about COVID-19 as I possibly could. Like you might feel right now listening to me, I was so tired of hearing everyone talk about COVID-19. However, my efforts proved futile because everything I was reading about the future of work from a pre-COVID-19 world felt so out of touch with the reality of the world we now live in. It is impossible to talk about the future of work and youth right now without talking about COVID-19 and the uncertainty that comes along with it. So instead, I have some good news and I have some bad news. Here's the bad news first. As I said before, my background is in public policy, so I hope you folks like statistics because I sure do. In the span of the first two months of COVID-19, the unemployment rate amongst Canadian post-secondary students skyrocketed, and only a quarter of previously employed students continued working their regular hours. The overall impact of COVID-19 so far has been that half of the youth aged 15 to 24 in the labor force are unemployed. Students indicated high levels of anxiety about their financial situation and future employment prospects. In the context of the pandemic, youth are usually found in precarious jobs to begin with, either in positions that can easily be cut, like internships or contract work, or jobs with higher risks due to multiple interactions with the public, such as client service roles. To add, COVID-19 will continue to lead to economic disruptions and uncertainties for the foreseeable future. The long-lasting impacts will affect many more graduating classes for years to come as they try to forge their way in the labor market and start their careers in one of the worst economic crises we've seen since the Great Depression. I don't think I have to convince you that COVID-19 has hit youth particularly hard over the last seven months, affecting every sphere of their lives. Pre-COVID-19, the employment situation for youth in Canada wasn't exactly great. Canada already struggled to bring down the youth unemployment rate. Even when the economy was doing well, overall unemployment had been decreasing and there was an optimistic outlook for the labor market of the future. COVID-19 had the effect of making matters worse for youth by increasing the economic precarity of a group already heavily experiencing it. In 2018, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development called attention to the fact that the employment outcomes for Canadian youth could be considerably improved. The OECD further underlined that there was a substantial minority of youth in Canada who lacked the opportunity to develop the skills needed for the labor market of the future. However, the report took a pretty macro level look at the situation. As youth in Canada consists of a pretty diverse group of people and employment prospects vary across regions and other factors. 
If we look more locally, we know that in particular, English speaking youth in Quebec experience higher levels of economic precarity than their French speaking counterparts. Research from the Community Health and Social Services Network and Youth Employment Services show that English speaking youth are underemployed compared to their French speaking peers, despite higher educational achievement. In the Quebec Civil Service, for example, Anglophone youth only represented 1.1% of student and intern hires in 2018, although the Anglophone population in Quebec is 7.4%. Young English speaking Quebecers are also more likely to live in poverty and come from single parent households. There are many barriers to employment that have been identified as facing English speaking youth uniquely and particularly as part of a minority official language community. Amongst these barriers is linguistic insecurity. The idea that youth feel that their French is not good enough to stay and work in Quebec. Other factors include a lack of a sense of belonging and youth feeling like there is no future or opportunities in their field in this province. So that's the bad news. Those statistics and reports I cited made the future of work for youth in Quebec seem pretty grim. But it's important to grasp the situation we find ourselves in if we want to tackle it head on. I didn't mean for the speech to be all doom and gloom though, because it's not. My goal was not to discourage you. That's the bad news, but now here's the good news. In policy, we are constantly looking for opportunities to bring forward solutions and make the changes we want to see. Sometimes, if you're lucky, the stars will align perfectly and a policy window will open. Policy windows are rare, but they represent turning points that make room for new and refreshing ideas and key decisions. Times of major disruptions are the perfect policy windows because they typically expose what is not working within a system and what needs to be fixed. COVID-19 is a policy window and presents a real opportunity for us as youth to make major changes to systems and structures to shape them for the future. Yeah, everything sucks. But if you've been looking for an opportunity to start working on a problem and its solution, the time has come and it's right now. You see, in my opinion, I think COVID-19 is the perfect time to start fostering youth-led entrepreneurship and innovation. As digital natives, we are more easily able to grasp the technology that have become parts of our daily routines and come up with creative ways to incorporate different platforms. We know how to make life during COVID-19 more engaging than just spending our days looking at a computer screen, or at least more bearable. As those who will be trying to establish our careers and livelihoods in the aftermath of COVID-19, it's crucial for us to have a say in what the economic recovery will look like. And a part of that is having a place at the table to voice our concerns and our solutions during discussions on the upcoming challenges and barriers that our industries will face. The OECD published a report over the summer about the future of work in Canada, given the new reality of COVID-19. It highlighted some of the difficulties and challenges facing employers and employees over the next couple of years, and also gave guidance as to what some possible solutions might look like. Amongst its solutions were demand-led training, sector-focused training programs, increased programs to link youth with opportunities in their industries, and the creation of local skills ecosystems. In other words, the OECD suggested doing exactly what we are doing here today. Demand-led and sector-focused training means having experts communicate current and specific skills needed and sought after in their industries, so that young people are aware of them and can develop these skills. This forum represents an opportunity to link youth with these experts. The creation of local skills ecosystems looks to regional development as a way to counter the negative impacts of COVID-19 by creating clusters of expertise and emphasizing regional strengths. While it's important to have discussions on the barriers and solutions specific to certain industries, it is the hope that these types of conversations will continue within the communities we are a part of. The OECD reports' key takeaway is one focus on community. In order to tackle the barriers and innovate solutions, there must be communication of needs, concerns, and ideas within and between different industries and communities. All of this means that we are taking the first steps together today 
to address the issues and barriers that have historically existed and those that might pop up along the way. We are headed in the right direction. I was asked to speak about youth, work, and the future, but if the last seven months have taught us anything, it's that the future of work is unpredictable and uncertain. But the future being unknown doesn't mean that it should be something we automatically have to be worried about. Like I said before, we are presented with what I believe is a golden opportunity to shape and mold, as much as is within our control, the future of work. When the future is unknown, it's a chance for us to make it more accessible, more equitable, and more representative. This afternoon, you are presented with step one of what will take a lot of hard work and effort. I'm confident in your abilities and reassured by your presence. If you're here, it's because you recognize that there are problems that are worth discussing and finding solutions for. You're here because you're passionate about your industry and you want to make the futures of these industries better for yourselves and for others around you. I feel immensely honored to be in and able to address a virtual room full of leaders like yourselves. While today you have the opportunity to listen to, work with, and learn from experts, I'm convinced that it will be all of you who will eventually fill their shoes. I'm optimistic that we, the youth, the Zoomers, will find our way, and I hope that we help each other out as we go. To go back to the story about me, my brother, and my friend from the very start of my speech, everything worked out for us in unexpected ways. In the end, I accepted an offer in law at Université de Montréal, something that I've been working towards for three years. Most days, it still feels like a dream come true. My brother, now in his final year in professional theater, learned the importance of having a backup plan, picked up some other hard skills, and is taking the time to fine tune some soft skills like communication and teamwork. My friend, whose internships she had lined up in preparation for grad school were canceled, used some of her back pocket skills to get herself a job in tutoring and learned how to find and land various, various volunteering opportunities that would help her develop transferable skills to complement her application. We all faced obstacles over the last several months, but we will learn to adapt and recognize what skills were needed to be able to adjust accordingly to the uncertainty brought about by COVID-19. To conclude, the bad news is that COVID-19 has thrown our personal past and our industries and futures into a state of uncertainty. The good news is that uncertainty can be a great place for growth and renewal with the right skill set and support. I hope that today's sessions give you that toolkit and network for facing that uncertainty squarely and head on. I hope it gives you a space to voice and discover your own challenges and struggles, but also to empower and embolden you to address them. It's true that youth are the future, but we are also the present. Like my mom says, the world is your oyster. Thank you, and on behalf of Youth for Youth Quebec, I hope you have a productive and engaging afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Madeline. The world really is our oyster. Um, uh, now, before we head to our expert sessions, I'd like to welcome Dr. Carr, uh, Dr. Graham Carr, President and Vice Chancellor of Concordia University. Bonjour tout le monde. Merci, Samantha. Um, thank you all for being here today, and a big thanks to Questrin's Interlevel Educational ta Table for for helping big, build links between uh, Quebec's English language colleges and universities and, and for creating this forum event. And I have to say, I wanna start just by, by echoing uh, much of what Madeleine had to say. It's, it's certainly hard to imagine a more difficult time for youth uh, than right now, particularly uh, as we look at not just the, the challenges of, of coping with the health effects of the pandemic and, and the isolation that it's causing, but uh, the uncertainty uh, that it has created in terms of the world of uh, world of work uh, and the future of work. And I guess my message from the from the point of view of um, of higher education and universities is that this is a moment of adaptation for all of us. Uh, and while there are a number of challenges out there, as Madeline also said, the news isn't all bad. Um, it's true that the pandemic has rendered 
uh, some career paths more problematic uh, than, than they might have been. But I think this is an opportunity as well for higher education, education institutions such as Concordia to respond and, and to adjust and to, to help do a different job to prepare students for the changing workplace of the future. And if I can just cite a couple of the ways in which we're, we're adapting and in which I'm sure those of you who are, who are students enrolled right now are also uh, adapting. Uh, obviously the first, uh, the, the first and most visible change is the switch to a near fully online uh, digital environment. And uh, uh, all of higher education has been forced into that quick conversion to remote teaching uh, this spring and it's continued over the summer and fall and will be with us for a, for a, for a time uh, to go in the future. But one of the things that I think we're trying to um, explore and understand at the university is how the move to digital is actually um, in some ways providing uh, good preparation for students in terms of the future of work environment. Uh, we were actually really happy to see that uh, our enrollments this year, despite the fact we're in a fully online environment, are ahead of where they were a year ago. Our drop rates are lower uh, than they were a, a year ago at this time and I recognize that's partly because students don't have a lot of options out there. Uh, and so school looks good. But I think the other reality is that, that uh, many higher education institutions are trying to seize this moment uh, as, a, as, a, as a chance to provide students with, with different skills, to allow them to network uh, in a digital environment, which, uh, which will be useful to them going forward, to be comfortable in that fully digital environment. And, and ironically, um, studying in this environment is a kind of is a kind of work integrated learning for people and that work integrated learning piece is something that uh, that we've always taken very seriously at Concordia our, our goal before the pandemic was to ensure that by 2025 all of our students had the opportunity to have at least one work integrated learning experience and when COVID hit we were concerned that we would uh, that we would lose opportunities for students uh, because businesses were having to adapt to the to the to their new situation. It wasn't clear what their employment strategy would be. Well, in fact, uh, this past summer we had more. We had over 200 more co-op placements in the summer of 2020 than we had in the summer of 29. And. 2019 and of the uh, 800 or so placements that we made the overwhelming majority of them were online placements so ironically one of the things which we've noticed is that the 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 online environment has not put an end to or slowed down work integrated learning opportunities in some ways it's created new work in, uh, uh, integrated learning opportunities Madeleine also mentioned that this was a great moment for youth innovation and entrepreneurship. And I think that's also really uh, very much the case. Some of you may know that uh, uh, Concordia has for a number of years run a very successful uh, incubator called District 3. And, um, and District 3, of course, uh, uh, functioned with a, a really great co-working space at the university, which isn't accessible at the moment. And we were concerned what was gonna happen to those startup teams. But in fact, the, the, the health crisis has created new opportunities, demand, demand for new services. It's created uh, uh, an appetite for new products and, and District 3 continues to flourish. And I think that that entrepreneurial uh, opportunity is very much there for, uh, for students uh, at the moment who, who, uh, who want to seize and be part of the innovation agenda. Um, maybe two other points before I stop. One is that that uh, I think what the pandemic has also uh, shown all of us is that is that learning uh, learning is a permanent exercise. It goes on and on and on. At the university, we're learning how to cope with the online environment, but we're all, what we're also seeing is that people are are now coming back to university who've had um, opportunities to work in the work face and of workforce and who develop professional careers and are now interested in upskilling and reskilling. Uh, to adapt to uh, to the new conditions we're all we're all facing, and I think that that's an important moment that we're experiencing as well. That uh, knowledge and skills acquisition is not something that happens uh, over a short period of time. It's really a lifelong process, and universities need to be more 
adaptive and better prepared, I think, to help, stu uh, to help students and return uh, uh, to pursue those additional skills. The last thing I'd say is that we're also learning, and this goes back to the point about what a difficult time it is. I, I can't overestimate the amount of pressure that the current situation is putting on, on our students. Frankly, it's putting a lot of pressure on our faculty and our, our staff as well. And one of the things that, that we're cer certainly noticing seven, seven months uh, into, the, into the pandemic is the challenge of finding a cadence at which people can um, continue to be productive and continue to, to, to feel, uh, not feel overwhelmed. And I think that's a challenge that we're all navigating right now is how to function effectively over the long haul in this, in this digital environment when we're all missing and regretting the face-to-face -face contacts that are certainly a very important part of university life, but socially a very important part of all our lives. And I think that's another, another issue that we really need to get our minds around as a higher education sector and as a society. What are the mental costs of, uh, of, the, of the pressure that we're feeling? And how is that a fa factor in allowing youth to, uh, to grow and, and to flourish and to continue to feel motivated in the online environment and continue to feel supported in the online environment? And that's one of the things that we're certainly trying to, uh, uh, to adapt to very quickly is how we can provide better services to support our students, uh, our students going forward. We're in a very, very strange time indeed. But all of which is to say that, uh, uh, you know, the future is always there for youth. And uh, just as Madeline feels confident that uh, youth will be uh, a key uh, component in, uh, in, in answering the needs of society going forward, so do I feel in the same way. Uh, I think the youth, who, youth uh, young, uh, Quebecers who are part of that uh, uh, digital generation uh, have ambitions for their own future and have ambitions for our social future collectively. Uh, and uh, universities are there, as is the higher education sector, to help you try to find the pathway that you want to a successful career and a pathway that, uh, that corresponds to your passions as well. So I wish all of you good luck. I know you've got a great program lined up ahead and uh, I hope to see some of you at Concordia in the future as well. Thank you, merci.